so yes, uh, my name is uh, Thomas Mazzano. A few of you might know me because I'm quite active on uh, on uh, on Twitter. Uh, my role is uh, global creative director of digital brand design at uh, at Philips. And I work in the design department of Philips. And I don't know who of you is familiar on what the role of design is in the Philips organization, but as opposed to many other organizations, design is not an outsourced thing. It's actually a function within the organization, much like IT is a function or, C or, or marketing is a function. So we are uh, represented with design management in the top levels of the organization up to board level with chief design officer. So we can actually say that design is really at the heart of the organization and creativity is as well. Uh, today I will be talking to you about social media and social media integration and uh, the strategy behind it and the, the, the journey that we've, uh, that we've followed in the last couple of years. Uh, but I'm especially going to focus on brand experience and how the function of brand design is playing a role in bringing brand experiences online or social media is an integral part of together. Uh, but before I do, I need to apologize because I'm not going to talk about ROI and I'm also not going to talk about budget. So please refrain of asking me these questions. So if we go back to 2008-2009, uh, like in many companies, social media started with bottom-up enthusiasm. Um, these infographics, they basically show uh, our Facebook presence pages, our Twitter accounts, and our YouTube pages uh, in two, early 2009. And this is global, by the way. And what you see is the size of each of these bubbles represents the amount of followers that these channels have, and the color uh, uh, shows the activity, red being they're completely inactive, so nobody is posting on it anymore from, from our side, from Philip's side, and the green ones are the ones that still have some engagement uh, going on. Now, it was clear that uh, this couldn't go on and that we had to start to get organized um, without hampering the enthusiasm and the, and, and the activities that in the country organizations that, uh, that they were doing. So. In 2008, the only thing that we really had to kind of start with was our brand principles, the things that basically tell us how we as a brand uh, not only look and manifest ourselves visually, but also how we be behave in words uh, and messaging. Uh, but this clearly wasn't enough for this new channel, for this you know, uh, dialogue channel that, that, that was arising. So in order to start to get to grips with this, we basically introduced three pillars that we embedded in the organization and are still uh, very much in place today. The first one being a cross-functional uh, fun functional team uh, on a global level where uh, at the core reporting into the CMO uh, of the global company we have B2B and B2C social media strategists uh, and around that um, we, are, we support it with the design function, corporate communications and IT as being core enabling functions to manifest a social slash marketing strategy. And surrounding that, we basically are, uh, have put together all the heads and all the representatives of all the different functions from legal to marketing to co country organizations, etc. And this is really the, the essence of, uh, of the entire strategy moving forwards, really putting all the functions together of the organization to learn and to share all the experiences that we have in the organization, to together determine priorities in programs and to share and leverage on best practices that we can then learn maybe in B2B and apply in B2C or vice versa. And so this is really um, it's not a, a governing board, but it's very much a knowledge sharing uh, a platform that allows us to have a global control over what is happening. Now, the second key part that uh, we established, and it's actually something that this team formed, uh, was the seven stage gate system. And although I'm not gonna show you the details of it, I can tell you it's a system that is basically put in place that enforces every social media initiative that the organization does to go through seven key steps of setting objectives, identifying the audience, basing uh, your uh, activities on key insights from this audience, establishing the key platforms and uh, ensuring the budgets are in place for ongoing enablement, and then to make sure that it's also being measured in the right way. 
And thirdly, to establish core components to really enable the organization. Because if we have in all different countries, um, we have uh, uh, all the different social media initiatives starting on their own with new listening tools, with new partnerships maybe with Facebook. Um, that is not very cost effective and actually we can support the local organizations across the world by providing certain centralized tools that they can leverage from and we train them in um, in order to get the most out of, uh, out of what we have put in place. So, the journey continued after that obviously um, with uh, the creation of guidelines or uh, let's say even tutorials that we, that we could implement because the basis of all this was people need to learn how to use these things and do it on their own. And we need to enable our organization and our employees to pick this up according to a certain framework but then enable them and inspire them to be active in social media and uh, um, find new ways how to exploit social media for their business needs, whether it's in HR, whether it's for marketing purposes, whether it's for innovation purposes, everybody needs to learn the mechanics and least needs to learn the details. So guidelines for every, every channel, we've made this for Twitter, for LinkedIn, for Facebook, uh, for YouTube, and we're continuously refreshing also these. They're available online so people can actually access them uh, globally. Uh, we've updated our brand guidelines, obviously, for, for the channels. So not only from a look and feel point of view, you know, how, do we, um, how do we create a Facebook page and how, do, how should you uh, brand it, etc., but also from a tonality point of view. So what is the tone of voice and how does that vary if you're in B2B or in B2C? And how does our, let's say, global brand values, how do they apply in social media when there is a dialogue instead of uh, a one-way uh, one uh, communication? A very important component to me has been SocialCast, which is our internal employee social network. It's not yet as sophisticated that it actually connects to the outside world, but at least it is a way to really socialize the organization. And keep in mind, it's 120 employees across the entire world. Um, this is the only way really to leverage on that global workforce. And it's very active. There's a lot of people, a lot of groups, a lot of sub-communities in there. Uh, and it really allows us to, to collaborate on, on, a, on a global scale, but at the same time also to find those people inside that are, have the tendency to be very online uh, uh, enabled and uh, use them and leverage them to actually become our spokespeople also outside of the organization. So it's a very good, uh, good tool. Next to that, uh, something quite basic but essential, an employee guideline. So if an employee goes on Twitter and goes on Facebook that he knows uh, what to do and what not to do. Um, sorry. And a web care toolkit. Uh, this, this has been a big effort of last year where we now have 20 countries who are completely rolled out on a web care, uh, from a web care point of view, so next to the support that you can get on our, on our .com, so on our site, we now also have Facebook care and Twitter uh, added to that. Uh, this booklet is a training booklet, so we've now, we're now going to each country to train the local team in order to pick this up, and in each country we now have uh, two people there uh, offering 24-7 uh, support. Um, and next to that is based on uh, these global high-level uh, processes and strategies, all the sectors, so this is uh, uh, the business to consumer sector, are translating that global strategy then into a sector strategy for consumer in this, uh, in this case. And also now in the process of rolling that out with their specific tools, whether uh, choices of Facebook and YouTube, uh, and also further building on the basic set of tooling that we've provided here. So this is a glimpse of how we've been going through, let's say, the major transformations and the major changes over the last few years. On top of that, we've started to add new KPIs, so new ways to measure, on top of the classical net promoter score, uh, of, of course, number of first buyer, return buyers, uh, the, the online sales and the, and the overall sales, Digital sentiment and engagement are two new components. We're still pioneering this in the sense that uh, they're not yet perfect and we're still, we continue to improve the way, the way they work. And actually right now there's a couple of mavericks 
that are trying to find the, go the, the, the holy grail and try to connect uh, digital sentiment to, uh, to sales and to create a correlation between the two and show that if there is a positive sentiment that we also can see a positive growth in sales. Of course, that is the holy grail, but I know there's a couple of people that really believe in this, uh, and I'm curious whether we will uh, be able to find it. But let's step back for a second, and because uh, we've talked about social media, we've talked about implementing it, and guidelines, and tools, and platforms, and it's all very important for an enablement point of view, but a, a, a core essence of enablement is understanding social media and understanding what it does and uh, I think ever since the Clue Train Manifesto I think we've always looked at online as the global village uh, but it's really now that it's starting to play out uh, because of, because of uh, social media, because of mobile media uh, and really what it's doing is bringing these old traditions back, these, these, these old ways of collaborating and of communicating and of being a community. Um, I mean, brands and people or manufacturers and people or trade people and, uh, and their customers, they've always been interacting, they've always been sharing ideas, they've always been receiving criticisms, they've always been collaborating to create a better product. Uh, it's just that in the Industrial Revolution somehow we've kind of alienated ourselves uh, because of scale and uh, a detachment with, with, with our consumers and with our audiences. And social media is bringing them back. And so for me this is also the story that I keep repeating when I'm talking at board level because this is the story that resonates. This they understand. And uh, if you understand this, then whether it's Facebook or whether it's LinkedIn or whether it's a check-in and it's location-based and it's solo mo or whatever it is, you start to understand what the basic drivers of people are. And if you make your decisions based on the drivers that people have, then you know, all the rest falls into place. Then you have your specialist that knows which technology is the hottest at the moment. As long as you understand this, you understand people and you, know, you understand how to, uh, how to do business. So, Brands and people have been inter interacting, and they are interacting now more than ever. And I like to call this brand experiences. Um, the experiences that I have as a consumer with a brand, or vice versa, uh, is an experience with the brand. And in order to really dive into this, I would like to do a little, little analysis on what is brand, because we all, see, we all have different perceptions of what a brand is, so I would like to kind of set the stage for that. And so, to start with, it's not just your logo, and it's not just your color, and it's not just your typeface. Huh? So a brand is much more than that. So let's look at a couple of definitions. And the, dis uh, the Dictionary of Business tells us uh, an, uh, a brand is a name, a sign, or a symbol used to identify items or services of the seller and to differentiate them from goods or competitors. Now, it's true but it's not just this. I mean, this is a very old-fashioned way of looking at brand. Maybe this stems from the, from, the, from the days that we were still branding cows and you would recognize the cows of your neighbors from your own. So this is very much true, but it's not just this. So let's look at another definition. Walter Lando, uh, one of the greats in advertising in the 60s, he said, and he moved a little bit further in saying brand is a promise and by uh, uh, identifying and authenticating a product or a service it delivers a pledge of satisfaction and quality. Now already this is a lot more sophisticated thinking around brand. It's all of a sudden it's not talking about a visual distinction, no, it's talking about a promise, about its quality and a pledge that it does to you as a consumer. But still I think we've moved beyond this already. Martin Neumeier is the author of The Brand Gap, uh, and I'm very much a fan of this, uh, of this guy. And uh, he says, a brand is the consumer's feeling about your product and your services and your organization. Now, this to me is the most sophisticated way to look at brand, but at the same time also the most complicated way to look at brand. Because you talk about the feeling, the emotional response that somebody has when uh, they think of your brand or when they experience your brand. <laughs> so
So how many of you thought of your laptop and thought of Microsoft when that screen flashed up? <laughs> right? It's the feeling that a brand uh, evokes with you. And just by showing you that blue screen of death, everybody laughs and everybody has that connection. And actually, Windows and Microsoft computers don't crash that often anymore. And that, and that blue screen of death, you don't see it that often anymore. But it's imprinted in your brain. And your feeling is influenced by it. A brand is what people think it is. Full stop. So, in a world where we have limitless access to information, always and everywhere, and we, you know, where we want experiences to go online and offline and back online and back offline again, and they're social with our friends, etc. Um, you know, the world of virtual is converging with the real world, and we expect these brands that we follow or not follow to add some sort of meaning to our lives. So how do we influence that when it's so scattered? And to me, you know, being at a conference talking about social media, to me, shows again that we, we have not evolved in the right way. It's not about social media, it's about everything. And, and everything we do is basically our behavior. The behavior we have is a brand. And it's what we do, and it's how we do it. And those two things determine how we feel about a brand. And going back to Philips, uh, every day, all over the world, we, we touch people's lives uh, with a very vast product portfolio, both in B2B and in B2C. And the brand experience that we promise and our pledge, and also what we want you to have, is one of simplicity. So sometimes I feel like we are in an orchestra and we're trying to play a brand symphony. And that when I look at my peers, my marketing department, the PR, PR teams, the country teams, that we're all these musicians and we all have our skills. Uh, we all play a different role. And it's time really that we play together and that we play as one orchestra. And we have a couple of things that we can play on and that is, that is our musical instruments. And the new thing about this, this model is, is that all of a sudden it's not just us working for this brand. No, all of a sudden there's new people playing along and it's our consumers. They're playing along with us. So all of a sudden we need to create a brand experience, a brand symphony, together with our consumers. With all our touch points, all our online, the, product, uh, the, 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 the websites, the Facebook pages, our products, the interfaces. You could think of these as being the instruments that we have as a brand to play different notes. The content, the conversation could be a note. A certain functionality that you have is one of these notes. And they need to play, need to play according to a specific score to play that harmonious symphony. They need to play harmoniously together. And that score, you could think that that is the journey that the consumer goes through from the moment that he is triggered and learns from your brand and learns about a new product to the moment that he starts to research it and actually goes and buy it. So if we look at this score, McKinsey put this in a model. I know McKinsey has been bashed this morning, but next to the bad thing, they also do, do a couple of good things. And I think this model is really showing the evolution of the purchase funnel. And it's the customer journey. And it basically, basically goes into a cyclical mode where there is a trigger that sparks off the interest of a consumer to start to dive and to research your product or your brand or your service. And he goes from an initial set of considerations into narrowing that down, very much as the traditional funnel looked, up until a moment of purchase. But that's where the old funnels kind of let us go because it's really after the moment of purchase that there is this new world opening where we can keep on having a relationship with our consumers. We can keep giving them value and keep learning from them as well. And we have, uh, we've had some cases also previous in the day about brand advocates and brand champions or super users. This is really where they start to do the work for you if you do, the, if do, you do your work well. So this is the score 
that tells us when to play what, when do we need to play which content, when do we need to have which conversation, and do we need to have it online, offline, or both. And these are really the instruments we have. This is the ecosystem. This is what we own and we can create. It's our own .com, it's our catalog, it's our shop. It's maybe an iPod, uh, iPad app, it's maybe a customer care center. And it's the platforms that we manage around it, like Facebook, like Twitter, like YouTube, and we have partnerships. Or it's the ring around it when it's really what we buy. It's the paid media, it's the blogs, it's the search, it's all of even the, uh, the brick and mortar uh, 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 retailers and also the Amazons of this world. And then outside in the white space, and I haven't even put it in a diagram, it's whatever is earned because it doesn't fit in a diagram. There's so much. Is it a comment in a blog? Is it somebody tweeting? It really can go everywhere when it comes to earned media. So these are the instruments that we can play. But the notes that need to be played also need to be carefully considered. Because the different notes, the content, the functionalities that we have have different purposes. They're there to drive reach and to inspire. There we can create content and we can create functionalities or applications to build uh, advocacy and to educate and enable. Or very simply, we need to make sure that we populate our, uh, our catalog with easy to understand content to explain our products and to inform people and to convince them about our products being better, cheaper, etc. from our competitors. And it's really these three things seamlessly being orchestrated together that will provide a seamless experience to our consumers. So, brand experience design. To me that is the basis of trying to harness this complexity and to harness this potential and to break down organizational silos which to me are the biggest challenge that big organizations like Philips are facing. The silos ain't gonna go. They're not gonna go anywhere. As soon as your organization grows to 120,000 employees, those silos are not gonna go. You need to install indeed leadership, but together with that leadership, methodologies and tools that allow to work through all of these silos. And brand experience design to me is one of these tools. And I'm gonna show you a case uh, where we did this for kitchen appliances, specifically in Germany. It's very important that context is king. Without context, you do not, you're, not, you're nowhere when it comes to creating an experience for somebody. So the first thing we did in uh, 2010 was we created, um, together with an agency who helped us, uh, we did a, a crowdsourcing uh, a research experiment where uh, for, uh, um, to learn about how people are using their kitchen, what they like, don't like, their processes, the challenges that they have. We have invited 30 plus people onto this digital platform, both in Spain and in, uh, in Germany, where we have geared them with cameras and video cameras and uh, gave them access to a blog and a journal and we specifically asked them to go about their normal lives, capture as much as they, they can and, and share that online. And all these insights uh, that, the, that we got out of it, uh, we then started to collect and also to add with our social listening that we were doing, normal metrics on the website, the amount of sales that we were doing, and any type of uh, also external research that was available to us to create what we call an experience flow. And an experience flow is basically an infographic that gives life to that score that I just showed you, that, that, that consumer journey from McKinsey. And it's capturing all the insights of that consumer behavior and experience. And the power of this is that we create this together with the other functions. So it's not us as a design team creating this and trying to preach that to the organization. No, we really collaborate together with market intelligence, with uh, the, the business group, with the market group to extract all the insights and the knowledge and then to create this. And by the way, this is a, usually a six meter poster that we then hang up in a room. Um, and I would like to, and I hope that this is going to work, I would like to just go through a few of the details. How much time do I have? 10 minutes, okay, cool. Um, so, 
it's basically telling the journey and giving you details of how one of our consumers in Germany is going through their online and offline experiences with, in relation to kitchen appliances. So what this uh, um, experience flow shows is first an insight into our target audience. We call this a persona and I think most of you probably have worked with personas so I'm not going to really go into details. But we also know that if a persona is not created in the right way they're not worth much. So it's really the enrichment of going in and really understanding their journey in the triggering phase. So what is somebody doing that is already, that has a family and has children to feed and is working and has a lot of challenges in, in getting healthy food on the table? And what are the strategies that she uses online or offline to answer the questions that she has? And what are the websites that she, that she uh, visits to give answers to that? And how could we then trigger that? And then once we have triggered somebody, what are the strategies that she then uses to find her information? Where does she go? And how do we look with other, comparison, uh, with other uh, competitors when we come on compar comparison sites? How are our product repre represented there? And what are the questions that she poses and that will make a difference if she is able to answer? And this goes on to basically once she has drilled down, okay, Philips seems to be a reasonable brand, now I'm going to visit their site and see if what really their product is about, how do we optimize that experience. Um, once they order it, what are the questions that they have when they order um, uh, a product and what are the concerns that they might have. But even when they first unpack their product, because don't forget, uh, if we're here in a social media conference, but the triggers for people to talk about a brand are these. If you unpack a product and you don't understand how to put together your new multi-mixer, blah, blah, and it has two million pieces, the chances that you're going to be a bit miserable about it and tweet about it or you know, complain about it somewhere are, are fairly, you know, fairly, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the chance is fairly high. So, and this is the cause and this is the root of solving those problems and actually make, trying to make a difference. And then there is a phase of use and we call, like to call it delight to engage. And this is probably the largest phase of all is when you own a product. And when you own a product that we have is how can we keep giving you value? And it's by understanding what the things are that you do with the product. And what is it that you're trying to solve with that product? Is it recipes? Is it uh, healthy food? Is it uh, uh, a complete weekly schedule of creating, uh, creating a healthy food for your family? And then ultimately, to find those people that are becoming your brand advocates and your super users and to really activate them and motivate them to share and to really go online and become your brand advocates. So that was the experience part. But if this still works, what we also add here is all the social listening insights and we try to capture key quotes that people are tweeting or people are Facebooking or are sharing or maybe even photos that they're sharing on, on, on Flickr with each other uh, and we attach them to these phases because this is actually what we can listen now and we, we know and can pinpoint also to specific focus areas that we might want to start to tackle and to solve. Quickly get out of this. Yeah. So that experience flow, I always describe it as it's basically your persona on steroids. So it's persona plus. And if used correctly, together with the different functions and together with marketing and PR and CRM and support, we basically lock ourselves up in a room and we start brainstorming. We look at what we've consolidated into this document and we own it together. And we brainstorm what can each of us contribute to a solution, to something better, to something that will delight our customers. And from those ideas we start to then articulate them in scenarios to try and bring them to life eh, so that we can also present them back to our senior stakeholders and convince them that they need to invest 
into, into this. And the fact that we are bringing together all these functions and we're going back to senior management with not an isolated pitch from a marketeer or an isolated pitch by customer support, but it's a joint effort, it makes it also a lot stronger. And eventually what this does, it allows us to really go and design. Because at the end of the day, if a designer is not designing something, it will actually never appear anywhere. So somewhere a designer needs to come into play. So we like to visualize in order to convince and tell the story. So for example, trigger to connect. Make sure that we are in the verticals with the right content and with the right bannering. Make sure that the landing places where we get people to is actually something which is of value to them at that point in time. Maybe even have an iPad app there that helps them manage their, their entirely weekly menus and inspire them with new ideas for new healthy recipes. Uh, optimize our search and make sure that when people land on big, uh, big e-tailers that we're there answering the key questions that they have. When they do a search on Kochen Maschine in Germany, they have 187 products that show up. So how the hell are they going to make a decision? If we're there with a buying guide, which then takes them to our own space, helping them to make a decision, that's the right point in time to help them with that key question. Help me make a decision. And then during their evaluation, make sure that when they go to our site, that they get the extra, they're not going to trust us anyway on, uh, when comparing from brand to brand. So when they are on our spaces, they would just want to experience the product in the best way they can. And that's also our key differentiator from a media mart or from any other online retailer. We can provide an experience to try and test already in a virtual form this product. So make that the best experience you can. And make sure that we capture all of the ratings and reviews. They're key when it comes to convincing people. Um, moment of purchase, CRM, even going in and creating new sketches on how to deal with an unpack experience uh, and redesigning the, 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 the quick start guide that comes out. Um, again, the iPad uh, app that plays a role both here if you don't have one of our products, but actually will really become very helpful if you own one of our products because it works seamlessly together. Um, and obviously our customer care because unfortunately we're not perfect <laughs> and products do break, but let's make sure that when some, something breaks that we create an, an optimum experience around that and that we help you and that we maybe even have something like a return box that we can send to you when something is broken down. And also have a special ambassador program in place for people that either are vocal or are sharing a lot online. Let's identify them, let's pinpoint them, and let's start to treat them as special. Let's uh, involve them in our product development, let's give them new products to try out and to talk about, because they will evangelize uh, what we are about. And so coming out of all this, we're able then to create briefings for all of the different functions. Because, of course, I've shown you many things, online, offline, uh, retail, uh, social media, etc. But because we've created a dream of something that we want to create, we now can create all the sub-briefings of all the sub-activities that need to start and to put a program in place. And this, from my point of view, is the best way at this moment that we are able to play this orchestra, to create this brand experience for people that are so demanding these days. And hopefully that's going to be one of simplicity. Thank you very much for your attention.